Hi, I'm James Naylor Green, professor of Brazilian history at Brown University and the national co-coordinator of the US Network for Democracy in Brazil. And this is Brazil Unfiltered. Brazil Unfiltered is a program designed to explain Brazil to those who know something about the country and want to learn more. I teach the history of Brazil to scores of bright young students at Brown University. Every time I begin a new semester, I try to rethink how to explain the complexities of Brazil to eager minds who have a vague notion about the country and its culture, but know little more. They might learn in middle school that the vast Amazon River Basin is threatened with deforestation by lumber, cattle, and agribusiness. They may have heard that indigenous people have organized to protect their lands from those who want to seize their territories that might be rich in gold or other valuable minerals. They may have read about the violent treatment by the police of Afro-Brazilian youth living in poor and working class neighborhoods. Perhaps they have a vague notion about the current president, Jair Bolsonaro, a former army captain who was forcibly retired from the armed forces and then became a federal congressman and then was elected president in 2018. In fact, they perhaps have learned that the international, that international journalists have called him the Trump of the tropics because of the similarities with the politics and practices of former U.S. President Donald Trump, with whom he has a close relationship. And if they pay close attention to international news, they may be familiar with the name Luis Inácio Lula da Silva, commonly known as Lula, the former two-term president who is currently the front runner in the October 22 presidential elections. So who exactly is Luis Inácio Lula da Silva? How did a former metal lathe worker from a very poor family become the president of Brazil? And why is he in, ahead in all of the polls? So first, I'm going to tell you a bit about his life story. Then I'll talk about his presidency from 2003 to 2010. Finally, I will explain what happened to him after his presidency and why he's ahead in the polls. So Lula was born in 1945 in the rural region of the northeastern, uh, northeastern Brazil in the city of Caetés, which is about 150 miles from Recife, the capital of the state of Pernambuco. He was the seventh of eight children. When he was two years old, his father moved with a female cousin of his wife to Santos, the port city of Sao Paulo, leaving the family at home. Now, this pattern of people leaving the impoverished areas of the Northeast to travel south for opportunities was quite common uh, in Brazil during the end of the period after World War II. Thousands and then hundreds of thousands of people migrated from poor towns and the countryside in the Northeast and in other parts of, of Brazil to the major industrial areas of Sao Paulo and Rio looking for new opportunities. They would usually travel to Rio or Sao Paulo on what is known as the Pau de Arara or the Parrot's Perch, which were planks positioned on large open air backs of trucks where people could uh, sit on, on, on these perches for the long arduous ride to uh, their destination. So people would arrive in Rio or Sao Paulo, they would stay with their relatives, they would work hard, they would seek out jobs in factories or in the service industry, and eventually have enough money to send uh, something back to their families uh, to help their families out. And this is a migration very similar in a lot of ways of to the great migration after World War I and World War II in the United States when mostly African-Americans migrated from the South to the North in search of jobs and opportunities. So when Lula was seven, his mother decided to travel with the entire family to Sao Paulo to seek out her husband. And she took a Pau de Arara, it took 13 days. And when she arrived uh, in, in Sao Paulo, she discovered that her husband in fact had a new family. Uh, although the two families tried to live together for four years, they didn't really get along. And so Lula's mother moved with the children to a room behind a bar. Lula didn't see his father very much, and he eventually died of alcoholism in 1978. Lula didn't have much schooling. He learned to read and write at age 10. He had two or three years of schooling and then had to quit school like hundreds of thousands of other poor family children to help the family income. He started out as a shoeshine boy and a street vendor. At age 14, he worked in a warehouse. And then he was very fortunate to take vocational training and a special program to become a lathe worker. While working in the factory, he lost one of his fingers and went to several hospitals before he could get treatment uh, for that injury. In 1969, he married Maria de Lourdes, 
who tragically died of hepatitis with her first child in 1971. So his experiences with the inadequacies of the public health system for poor and working class people was one of the many reasons he promoted social service programs as president. In 1974, he married Marisa Leticia Rocos Casa, who was a widow with a child who Lula adopted, and they had three sons. He joined the labor movement and rose to the presidency of the Metal Workers Union of San Bernardo in 1975, and then was reelected in 1978. And San Bernardo was one of the cities surrounding the city of Sao Paulo, which has a large concentration of factories and industrial production. Now, this is during the military dictatorship, which ruled Brazil from 1964 to 1985. And there was tremendous repression of opposition to the military's rule. At the same time, especially after 1968, there was a certain amount of economic expansion and uh, opportunities for trained industrial workers to find employment as the economy expanded and there was more demand for consumer goods. Lula was very fortunate to get a job in the automobile industry and therefore was able to see a certain amount of upward mobility in his own life. Other workers joined underground organizations to fight against uh, the military regime. And among them was Lula's brother, known as Frei Chico, who joined the Communist Party and was arrested and tortured in the mid 70s. And this had a very important effect on Lula because he realized that he didn't wanna take the path of his brother. He wanted to really oppose the policies of the, of the military regime through legal means, but he also had an understanding of the implications of, of resisting the military because of the fact that his brother had been arrested and tortured. So workers during this period of the late 60s and the early 70s were actually doing relatively well. They could buy a refrigerator, get a TV. Some of them even, even were able to purchase cars. However, uh, inflation that started taking off in 1973 and 1974 undercut uh, their standard of living. And at the time, the finance minister lied about the in, uh, inflation rate. And so workers started mobilizing to regain lost wages that had, that had been uh, illegally manipulated in official government calculations and therefore were undercut when companies would give uh, wage increases. This led to a strike in 1978 in which workers um, organized independently a wildcat strike in factories throughout the area uh, of Greater Sao Paulo. Uh, and this was illegal at the time. The strikes were not permitted under the military's labor legislation. Um, the companies, many of them were foreign companies, mostly General Motors, Ford, and, and other international automobile companies quickly negotiated with the workers, agreed to their demands, and they actually were quite successful. Although Lula did not initiate these strikes, he led them in the sense that the, the union took an active role in, in uh, leading them and being successful. And, uh, and then the next year, uh, because of this tremendous uh, uh, success of the strikes of 1978, there was a wave of strikes throughout the country. All over the country, people were demanding an increase in wages to keep up with inflation. And really we're striking against the economic and labor policies of the military regime. In 1980, there was a third set of strikes in São Bernardo in the region around São Paulo uh, that was also led by Lula. And this time he was imprisoned for violating the National Security Act. And uh, he and other trade union leaders were uh, were put in jail. Now, I was living at Brazil, in Brazil at the time. I was living in Sao Paulo. I was studying at the University of Sao Paulo and was able to participate actively in all the mobilizations in support of the workers on strike. One of them was on May Day of 1980, the unions called on people to join a big demonstration, a big march through the city of São Bernardo and to go to a soccer stadium near there for a big rally. Uh, and I joined a group of 50 gays and lesbians uh, at the time, carrying a huge banner saying against the discrimination of homosexual workers as part of this mass mobilization in support of the strike, uh, which was really a way of, of opposing the military regime. In 1980, Lula lost the strike. Uh, and this was a real kind of defeat for the victory of, of the labor movement, which had been relatively successful the other the, uh, previous two years. And then the military decided to carry out a series of measures to undercut the growing opposition to its rule. One of them was to allow exiles to return from abroad, uh, political exiles who had left the country or were forced to leave the country uh, were allowed to return. 
And the military then decided to eliminate the two political parties that is set up during the military regime and establish uh, new political parties or allow new political parties to be established. And so among the different new political parties established was the Workers' Party. And I'm going to refer to it as the Workers' Party or the PT, which is its name in Portuguese, Partido dos Trabalhadores. It was founded in 1980, uh, and it represented the energy of this new politicized and mobilized trade union movement. And it was a political party that was a coalition of different forces. It included the progressive uh, sectors within the Catholic Church, trade union activists and leaders, uh, many socialists, former revolutionaries who had been involved in the radical opposition to the military regime uh, and others. And it really became a party that represented at the moment, at that time, a radical social democratic program. That is a program like the social democracy of Europe that we're familiar with, but with a more radical program calling for more radical measures to solve the economic, social, and uh, cultural problems of Brazil. The PT grew in the 1980s and in fact participated actively in the first presidential elections in 1989. Lula was one of many candidates and he managed to get into the second round against a former governor of a state of the Northeast named Fernando Collor de Mello, who ran on a campaign against corruption. And at the end of the campaign, in the second round, just as Lula was forging ahead in the polls, uh, the opposition brought to the media a child that had been born uh, out of uh, a relationship that Lula had had with a girlfriend between the time his first wife died and he married his second wife. Uh, at the time when this woman got pregnant, he offered to pay for an abortion. Abortions were illegal at the time, but they were possible. She declined, and then he agreed to support her. Uh, and many years later, the opposition brought this young woman to the to the press, to the media. She made some comments. It really upset Lula. It really caused a kind of a, a pause in the campaign. It kind of caught him off balance. And it was one of the many reasons why uh, Lula lost the election. He didn't do well in the last debate, and he finally was defeated by uh, six points. Um, the new government of Collor Gimelo uh, confronted a tremendous amount of inflation. Collor Gimelo, who was, uh, was elected, was impeached by the House of Representatives, and he actually left the office uh, of presidency before he was voted uh, uh, to be impeached by the, by the Senate. Collor Gimelo left office. The new vice president uh, faced massive inflation. So he appointed the Minister of Foreign Relations, Fernando Enrique Cardozo, to be the new Minister of Finance. Cardozo had been a sociologist. He had been exiled during the military regime. He returned, he was involved in politics. He had been uh, uh, a candidate for the Brazilian Social Democracy Party uh, and was asked to uh, reorganize the economy. He brought together a group of economists who ended up implementing a new currency and controlling in inflation. And with the effective uh, limiting of the tremendous inflationary uh, surge in the country, uh, he ran for office against Lula and was elected and then re-elected. And it, one of the kind of characteristics of his first term in office was to uh, really in, encourage the selling off of state-run industries, to denationalize industries that had been nationalized in the 50s, the 60s, and during the military regime. Soon after his second uh, run for office, uh, he uh, ran into an economic crisis. There was a crisis in the exchange rate. It weakened the center right. Uh, many of the investors were very concerned about his weakened position and who might succeed him. But they were all really concerned about the fact that Lula, who had run for office three times, might run again and actually might win. Uh, they were fearful that if Lula did win, a person who uh, allegedly was a radical socialist, that the economy would fail. Now, Lula by this time had realized that he was only going to win the election if he reconfigured his image and communicated to the Brazilian people that he wasn't, in fact, a radical, dangerous socialist, and that he was really going to guarantee that the economy would not be threatened by his policies in, in the presidency. Um, he hired some very successful uh, people who worked in, in uh, marketing. He presented himself uh, as they would call him Lula Light, or that is in locale Lula, or Lula Light, or Lula Peace and Love. And he then wrote a letter to the Brazilian people that if he were elected, he would not take any major steps to change the Brazilian economic uh, system. He ran against uh, 
a former student activist, a son of Italian immigrants who had been also in exile and uh, had come to the United States after a period of time in Chile to get a PhD in economics, had been the Minister of Planning and the Minister of Health under Cardozo and uh, ran a campaign against Lula who won in the second round of the elections. So in 2003, Lula became the president of Brazil, the first truly working class president to assume office, a person who had deep roots in the poverty and the suffering and the repression that working class people experienced during the military regime, and a person really committed to carrying out a series of social programs to challenge poverty, uh, inequality, and other problems that ordinary people face. He expanded social programs and his uh, kind of uh, crown jewel in this array of programs that he initiated was something that became known as Bolsa Familia or a family stipend, which was a small amount of money given to families if children remained in schools and were vaccinated. But he did many things while he was president. He constructed a, a, a string of new universities in the uh, secondary or tertiary towns of different states so that poor and working class people who wanted to go to the university didn't have to migrate to the capital and, and enroll in the federal universities. He carried out an independent foreign policy, which had a long tradition in Brazil, in which he did not break with the United States. In fact, he actually got along quite well with George Bush, but he also reached out to people in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, and really wanted to uh, disentangle him, uh, the Brazil from uh, unconditional alliance with the United States. Now, he didn't have a majority in Congress. The PT, the Workers' Party, elected many federal, federal Congress people, but they didn't have a working majority. And so people around Lula uh, in, in his staff and people who were his political supporters started buying votes by members of Congress in order to get his agenda approved. Now in the United States, we kind of buy votes in a certain way. If, you, if I uh, have a lot of money and I want a certain piece of legislation to be passed, I can donate a million dollars to my congressperson. I will meet with him. I will tell him or her that I'd be very happy if a certain piece of legislation is introduced in Congress. I might organize a PAC to get other people to uh, talk to other Congress rep congressional representatives to get that piece of legislation passed. And my money likely will be effective in, in, in getting that legislation passed. That's an indirect way of buying votes. In Brazil, that's illegal. Lobbying is illegal. And therefore, uh, people supporting Lula decided to circumvent the system and the laws of the system by making monthly payments to certain people in Congress uh, in order to get them to vote in certain ways. One of the people denounced this. Uh, there was a big investigation. Uh, Lula claimed he did not know about it. But many people were uh, actually finally uh, put in prison for having uh, carried out a uh, violation of, of Brazilian electoral laws. Nevertheless, Lula was reelected in 2006, continuing moderate policies. Um, he reached out and consolidated the relations between a series of countries that were known as BRIC or BRICS, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, large and per, uh, important industrializing countries in which he felt it was important for Brazil to have a close collaboration and, and partnership. And his economic policies led to a drop in unemployment and increase in wages, and about 30 to 40 million people leaving absolute poverty to having a certain amount of income necessary to sustain themselves and their families. And this was one of the most dramatic elements of his program, because for the first time, those who traveled to Brazil, those who knew Brazil, did not see the excessive numbers of people in the streets begging, living off, this, off, 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 off the streets because there was enough social service uh, programs developed to uh, eliminate a large scale uh, impoverishment of millions of people in the country. His policies also extend, expanded the internal market, encouraging consumption, people acquiring credit cards and, and credit card debts, unfortunately. And in fact, Brazil managed to escape the 2008, 2009 economic crisis in the United States that then spread worldwide. In fact, Lula at a meeting of the G20 very ironically said that uh, the irrational behavior, uh, the, the economic crisis was actually caused by the irrational behavior of white people with blue eyes who before seemed to know everything and now show that they don't know anything. 
It was a critique of the ways in which the economies of the United States and the policies of, of uh, finance capital had really caused uh, a worldwide havoc. Um, he left office in 2010 with 80% popularity and was able to handpick his successor, his chief of staff, Jim Hosefi, who had been uh, another person who had been part of the opposition to the military regime, who was elected in 2010 and assumed office in 2011. And as you know, and we're going to talk about this in another program, Jim Hosefi was impeached in 2016. So Lula left office incredibly popular. Jilma's government started losing popularity in 2013, and this spread to a very concerted campaign on the part of sectors of the judiciary and sectors of the media to tarnish the image of Jilma Hosefi and Lula because it was feared that after Jilma finished her second term in office, Lula might in fact want to run for president again. And in Brazil, you can run for two terms, and then you can leave office for a term, and then you can run again. And so uh, a, pers- a, a p- prosecuting judge in the state of uh, Paraná and the city of Curitiba began investigations about some illicit behavior happening in Petrobras, the state oil company, in which executives of the state oil company were skimming off money from bids for contracts and pocketing them and sending them abroad. Uh, and construction companies were also giving illegal donations to politicians of all political parties in order to also get favorable contract treatment. The judge who was involved in these investigations was named Sergio Moro. And the uh, investigation was known as as Lava Jato or Operation Car Wash because the original uh, money laundering was taking place in Brasilia in a a car wash. Um, And so as investigations went on and on, Sergio Moro decided that he considered that Lula was also involved in illicit activities. And the first charges against Lula was that a construction company had offered to his wife to purchase uh, an apartment in the resort town of Guarujá near uh, the city, the port city of Santos uh, on the coast of, of Sao Paulo. Um, in fact, uh, the construction co- company showed the apartment to uh, Lula's wife. She really didn't like it. And so she asked for it to be remodeled a little bit and eventually decided she didn't want to buy it. Uh, and uh, uh, that was it. She never had the property. She never had title to the property. But the prosecuting attorney charged that Lula, in fact, was receiving this uh, apartment for uh, favors that he was going to give or had given to uh, this construction company. Uh, This went to trial. Uh, He was charged with uh, illicit behavior. He was sentenced to 10 years. And on appeal, he was uh, given three more uh, years uh, sentence. And... um, there was other charges against him for allegedly owning a, a country home that he stayed in that was owned by friends of his um, during a period of time and other charges that he was involved in kind of illicit corrupt activities. So he appealed and, as I said, got a, a 13 year uh, sentence. And according to previous legislation actually endorsed by the Workers Party, if a person were convicted uh, on uh, of a crime, they would not be able to run for office. Uh, and This was understood that this was only the case when all of the appeals had been exhausted. And in the case of Lula, he had the right to appeal all the way to the Supreme Court. However, the Supreme Court ruled in in Lula's case, in fact, having lost the appeal on the second uh, uh, level, that he was in fact uh, eligible to to be a candidate for the 2018 elections. And he also had to serve time in prison. And so he was uh, arrested and how he was going to be arrested, he he went to the trade union uh, headquarters in San Bernardo, occupied it, uh, carried out a, a visual a vigil there for a period of time, and then uh, informed the, the authorities that he was going to turn himself in, and was uh, in fact taken to uh, to prison in Curitiba, where he served 580 days. Uh, then uh, it was determined. Uh, that it was discovered after he had been in prison that in fact, Sergio Moro had been in collusion with the prosecuting attorney. The prosecuting attorney and he were exchanging communications, were changing uh, messages on on, uh, their iPhones and a hacker hacked into their iPhones, revealed all this information. It was clearly that there was something really illicit going on between 
the prosecuting judge, the judge and the prosecuting attorney. Um, and even though this was revealed after Lula was put in prison, the elections took place. Lula could not be a candidate. So he chose instead to have in his place a man named Fernando Haddadji, who had been the minister of education under Lula's government and also the mayor of Sao Paulo. And Haddadji won 45% of the votes, but Jair Bolsonaro won the election. So many were outraged by this way in which the elections were manipulated, that Lula was not allowed to be a candidate. He had been ahead in the polls. Um, and they were even more outraged when after Bolsonaro won the election, he appointed Sergio Moro to be the minister of justice. So after the hackers' the revelation of all this collusion between the prosecuting attorney and Sergio Moro, instead of Sergio Moro resigning or being forced out of office, he stayed into office. Um, later, the Supreme Court declared that the judge, that Lula was uh, illicitly uh, charged with these crimes, that there had been collusion, that in fact, uh, Sergio Moro had been biased, and all of the charges against him were dropped. Uh, some of them were thrown out because of jurisdictional questions, and one or two are still pending, but it's unlikely that he will be uh, prosecuted for any of them. So, so you have a situation that in 2018, Lula is ahead in the polls. He's rushed through the court system to make sure that he is condemned and not allowed to run for office. He's imprisoned. He chose he chooses not to leave the country or to go to into exile or to ask for political asylum and serve time in prison. And then later is proven that he was unjustly uh, accused of crimes and the judicial system in fact, did everything possible to uh, keep him in prison and prevent him from being a part of the elections. So what's gonna happen now? Lula's ahead in the polls. He has about 45% of popularity against Bolsonaro who is ranging at 20 to 25%. All the other candidates have less than 8%. Anything could happen. Can't predict anything at this moment. There are at least 100 impeachment petitions against Bolsonaro in Congress. But the Speaker of the House, who's an ally of Bolsonaro, has refused to receive or accept any of them. And even though there's been united mobilizations monthly now calling for his ouster, the main bloc in Congress, the Centrão, is still supporting him. And it looks like it is unlikely that Bolsonaro can, will be impeached. Although, as I've said, anything can go, anything can happen. So the anti-P forces are looking for a viable third candidate. They're trying to find someone who can actually get popular support. And so far they've been relatively unsuccessful. Lula, on his hand, is seeking out moderate support in order to get parts of the center of the political spectrum to support him. And I would predict that if Lula is elected in October of 2022, and comes to office in 2023. He will moderate his policies. He will rule from the center. He will be a government that is not radical or socialist as his opponents claim, but a person that unites the country and tries to reignite, reinitiate all of the social justice programs that he developed in, um, in his time as president for eight years. However, strong social movements, which have been involved in fighting against Bolsonaro's policies, will probably be very important in the movement to influence Lula and his policies to push him to carry out, to implement the promises he'll make during the election campaign. He will also probably have some significant support uh, in Europe, especially among social Democrats. I imagine he will try to develop a favorable relationship with the Biden administration, but also with the People's Republic of China. Uh, he will continue to carry out a policy that is have been decades long in Brazil of trying to find a third way in international politics. But as I warn you, anything can happen. Before we go into the segment of our program, Brazil in the News, I'd like to recommend this book that will really go well with the podcast and the YouTube program today. Lula and the Politics of Cunning, From Metal Worker to the President of Brazil by John French is an outstanding account of the early life of Lula, from his childhood in the Northeast, in the state of Pernambuco, to his travels to Sao Paulo, and to his involvement as a union activist and a union leader. It really will give you the context for the importance of Lula, his 
way of understanding politics and understanding social change in Brazil. John French is an outstanding historian of Latin American history. He studied at Yale with uh, Emilio Viota da Costa, who was a political exile historian who trained a whole generation of outstanding uh, scholars of Latin American history. And you'll really enjoy the book. 